everyone. Uh, apologies for those who are standing. It's a full house tonight. <laughs> Always a good sign to see everybody out. Um, so, yes, as uh, Richard said, I'm going to be introducing our guest speaker, uh, Peter May. But before I welcome up on stage, I'm just going to give you a brief background about him. He uh, got his Bachelor of Arts from the University of Guelph in 1977. From 77 to 82, he was a technician at the Vertebrate Paleontology Department. I had to practice that one a couple times before I got up here. <laughs> Uh, from 1982 uh, to 1986, he was a senior technician at the Royal Tyrell Museum in Drumheller, Alberta. From 86 to 91, he was a chief technician at Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto. And from 1987 to president, uh, present, <laughs> he was the president of Research Casting International Limited in Trenton, Ontario. I'm sure many of you have seen it during doors open. It was hard to get in there. <laughs> Uh, so, Peter May, with 12 years of experience working in the paleontology department at the Royal Ontario Museum uh, and Royal Tyrell Museum, saw an opportunity to establish a company that would serve the technical needs of museums locally, nationally, and internationally. Uh, incorporating Research Casting International Limited in 1987, uh, 32 years later, with 500, uh, sorry, 50,000 square feet and 35 employees, it's the largest company in the world providing technical services for museums internationally. Please welcome to the stage, Peter May. Thank you very much. So it's quite a crowd tonight. Um, I don't think we've ever done a standing room only before, but there are still some empty seats. Um, so I, I'm the owner founder of uh, Research Casting International and uh, established the company in 1987 after I moved back from Alberta. And um, I'll, I'll go through it a little bit at a time. Let's see. So we're in Trenton, Ontario. Um, 40,000 square feet, and uh, what we do is uh, a whole suite of things. We do uh, fossil preparation, conservation, uh, we mount original fossils, we mold original fossils, we cast them, we uh, scan, scan fossils now, which is a more, more modern approach to molding and casting. We, we do uh, 3D scanning, and we, we do printing, we have five access milling machines. Um, we have a foundry, we're capable of casting bronze or aluminum, uh, the, the five axis router. We sculpt, which is becoming less and less, but we, we still have a good crew of sculptors and we have five blacksmiths on staff. So we have a lot of the modern world and quite a bit of the, uh, the old world. And we also do uh, concrete work, we, we do earth, fake earth, and uh, manufacture exhibits. So where I began was the University of Guelph. And I, I graduated there in 1977, and my first job when I left was at the, uh, the, the, the Royal Ontario Museum. And I had the exact same problem saying vertebrate paleontology technician as, uh, at, at the introduction. Um, I was working at the time at, at, at Stalco in Hamilton, and uh, I saw an ad in the paper for, for a technician, and, and I called him up, got the interview, and uh, I was at the ROM and I had one rubber mold that, that I'd made in my, my career at school. And uh, all, all our molds were, were waste molds out of plaster and we chipped them all out. And I had one rubber mold that I was so proud of and went in there. And uh, the, the HR person, I pulled it out on her desk and had plaster and everything and said, hang on, hang on, hang on, we'll, we'll call Gord, who, 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 who was my mentor and went down and saw him, had the interview. And I was more interested that time in how the molds were being made than the job. And, and, and I was fairly well dressed up for the time, like it was a 21 year old, 22 year old. And uh, I came out filthy, but I had the job. So, and then from there I went to the Toronto Museum. Um, I, I met Phil Curry in, in England, I was doing a, um, a course at the Natural History Museum in London. And, and Phil Curry came by and he's the um, 
at that time, he was the, the director of the Terrell Museum. And he asked me there if I was interested in a job out, out to help, help, help him build the museum. Uh, I, I drove out there with my wife, and we hit the Badlands and went down into the valley. And we thought, no, nah, I don't think I want to stay out here. But then what happened was we came home, and uh, we held out a little bit, held out for a bit more money, and then they offered me a senior technician's job with quite a bit more money that I was making with ROM, so we moved out west and helped build the, the Terrell Museum. And at, at the end of my time there, I was in charge of the park, Dinosaur Provincial Park, and we were working on the uh, Canada China project at the time. We, we had technicians, scientists from China coming to the park, and we housed them there, and we went out, and then from there, expeditions went to China to have a look for fossils there. And it was at, at that point in time when I left to come back to the ROM. Um, I was married, had two kids. Our, our family was back east in uh, Mississauga at the time. So we moved back, and uh, I came to the ROM again, and uh, on the promise that I, I could still go in the field. Because the ROM at that time had had a, a reputation of, of not doing field work. And out in Alberta, that's all we did. Like, we were in the field from uh, uh, probably Easter all the way through to Thanksgiving. And that's all we did was collect dinosaurs all the time we were out there. And, and, and it's a passion I have. So we went out to um, BC, Williston Lake in, in BC, um, just uh, west of Fort St. John. And we found the, the, the best upper Triassic deposit, uh, marine deposit of uh, fossils in, in the world. And, and it's still there today, and that's a little ichthyosaur like on the bottom there. So it was a very successful trip. And then um, I was back at the ROM, and then a phone call, would I mount a dinosaur in my spare time? So um, I, I was working full time, and, and, and then at night, making casts of dinosaurs. And uh, the first call I had was from the American Museum of Natural History. Um, they, they called me up and asked if, if I could mount their, a cast of their, the Barosaurus rearing up on its back. And, uh, and I thought, yeah, I could do that. <laughs> and so we, uh, we, we had meetings down there and had a chat. And then uh, they gave us the, their skeleton, the, the, the Barosaurus skeleton. We, we brought it back to Oakville at the time. That's where our shops were. And we took molds off it. And uh, all of this was part time. We did this. And then I also had a call from the Natural History Museum in England, and they wanted us to mount another 12 cast of dinosaurs. And another museum from Iwaki City in Japan, they called and asked if we could mount another 15 cast dinosaurs. So here I was working part time, and I had probably a million and a half dollars worth of work to do. So I, I went to the, the, the board of directors at the ROM, and I said, look, why don't we make a department within the ROM and mold and cast dinosaurs from museums around the world, and we'll, we'll run that under the, the ROM banner, and we'll make some money for the museum. So I, I went all the way up to the, the, the board of directors, made my presentation, and I was told at that point that museums aren't in the market of making money. So I, I had no choice. So I uh, had, had a chat with, with my boss, Chris McGowan at the time, and just said, look, I, I can't really stay, but I won't leave you in the lurch. So I worked for another year at the ROM, and, and I started at 6 o'clock in the morning and worked till 2 in the afternoon. And then I'd go work, work full time on all the other projects we had. And in the meantime, I hired a head technician, trained him over a year, and, and then left the ROM. And I'm still a, an, an associate at the ROM. So I haven't burnt that bridge. And this is the work we did at the, uh, the Natural History Museum. Uh, the Diplodocus now is gone. They put in uh, Hope, a big blue whale. And I'll, I'll get to that later because uh, their um, head of conservation called me up and uh, she'd had a chat with the president of their museum. And, and they said, well, why are you going to a Canadian company? She said, well, they just like Mark and Spencer's. They never go away. <laughs> because because we, we worked there in 1992 and still, still going strong today. Uh, we had a little departure from museums, and we did the skeletons for the original movie Jurassic Park. So um, I had read Michael Creighton's book, and then uh, I was reading the, the, the Toronto Star, and there was a little article that said, um, 
Spielberg w w was, was going to make a movie Jurassic Park. So uh, I wrote them a letter. This was before fax and emails and everything else. So I, I wrote a letter to them and said, if you want original dinosaur material in the movie, just, just, just let me know and we'll put something together for them. And they called back and they said, sure. Why don't you come on down, we'll have a chat about it and see what you can do. So I went to LA and had meetings with them and this is what they came up with was a Alamosaurus being attacked by T-Rex. And that's what was going on in that main rotunda. And that's the only time uh, we've ever had a dinosaur fall down. <laughs> and then after that, we started selling a lot of things to Japan. Um, there was a, a mandate supposedly that every prefecture had to have a museum with a dinosaur. And this is in the, the mid 90s, before they had their crash. So we, we were called upon to um, do a lot of work in Japan. Um, we had one, an ankylosaur went to a small town and um, they had an allosaur on display at their museum. And the, uh, it was an eyeglass company owned the museum in the small town and also put a large museum in uh, Kyoto. And then uh, they called and said, could we give them a new museum, a, a new dinosaur for their old museum because they'd moved their dinosaur out and all the children in the area had been complaining that they didn't have a dinosaur at the museum anymore. <laughs> so we, we built a dinosaur for them, an armored dinosaur, an ankylosaur. We took it over there and uh, it was blessed by a, a priest, Intel priest. And we had uh, a really, really nice time there. We had a green tea ceremony, the original one with the band, with the mayor, and we dressed in kimonos with the little wooden shoes. And it was quite a time. And they still, um, last year they had a dinosaur expo in Tokyo. And uh, it went on for four months. And I think they had three million people attend. So that they still have a love for dinosaurs in, in Japan. And then towards the end of the 90s, we uh, were called by the American Museum of Natural History to, to work on their, uh, the Hall of Planet Earth. Um, part of it was going to Hawaii, and we, uh, we collected a lava tree. And I don't know if you've been to Hawaii, but they say if you remove lava from Hawaii, you're in for a lot of bad luck. Pele's not too happy with your taking her uh, lava away. So <clears throat> we, we were out the uh, night before with Volcano Jack, and he was the advisor from the survey in, uh, in Hawaii, geological survey, and he was the expert on volcanoes. So we sat down with him, we had dinner and talking, they said, I know what we have to do, because he, he was concerned about us moving all this lava off, off the island. So next morning, we're, we're driving in, and the uh, American Museum uh, curators and technicians were with us, but they didn't know what our plan was. So we were on the way in and we pulled into a, a, a plaza and there was a liquor store and we came out with 12 bottles of gin. <laughs> and, 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 and Jack had a whole, whole pile of garlands and everything else. So we, we went there and he had a, a poem or a song that he sang in Hawaii as he um, went around and around the tree. And our job was to pour gin all over the... Um, the lava tree. And then um, we put all the garlands on and everything else and, and then we, we were allowed to collect it and bring it home. And <laughs> so it's a story. And for the same job, we went to um, Sakara Point in Scotland. And what you're seeing here, um, you have red beds on top here and then you have gray stone below it. And what it is, the rocks on top here are from North America and the, the gray rocks below are European. So what's happened, it's an unconformity where the, the rocks from Europe have come over top. So we took a mold, uh, this is the North Sea. And when we went there, we thought we just, we, we had ladders. <laughs> and we, we, we went there, we had our ladders and we thought pretty good, we'll just go and we'll put ladders up and some scaffold and we'll take this. And then they said, no, 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 this is where you're gonna do it. And we found out when we arrived in Scotland. So, it takes about a week to prepare for it. And what we ended up doing, we put a ground anchor up on top and we welded up the stage and then we had winches and we went, put the, uh, the, the stage down and then we painted rubber on it. And then this is a cast at the American Museum. No, it was a fun job. And then they said, could we make some planets? So we said, sure. <laughs> so, so we made all the planets for the, uh, the, the planetarium. And, uh, And then, we're still in New York City, and uh, they came along and they said, could we put bronze skeletons in the, the subway system? And at the time, we didn't have a foundry at all. So we um, 
what they wanted from us was the, uh, the rubber forms to go to the foundry so that they could make molds in uh, sand, green sand. And they asked us what it would cost for the molds, and that blew their budget from our part. Their whole budget was blown. So they came back to us and said, well, for another 100000 could you do everything in bronze as well? So my head technician, Matt Fair, we sat down and we said, sure, we could do it. So what we did, we went down to Cincinnati, or Cleveland, and we found um, some old foundry gear and warehouses down there, and we brought it all back, and we, we cast up all the bronze. We didn't make any money on the job, but we did get a foundry out of it. And, uh, and, and the one uh, interesting thing, this uh, small animal here, it's called a coelophysis, and it's an early or mid-Triassic uh, meat-eating dinosaur. And uh, the quarry is in uh, New Mexico, and it's Ghost Ranch is where the quarry is. And they, they found hundreds of these skeletons all, all in a bone bed. And they, all, they always thought that in their stomach were small skeletons in the stomach, and they thought, well, they'd been eating their babies. And, and this was the whole thing up until um, not too long after we installed it, and there was a, a student who was waiting for the subway, and he looked at the skeleton, the bones in the, the tummy here, and he said, that's not a coelophysis, that's a crocodile. So it turns out they weren't eating their babies, they were actually eating crocodiles. <laughs> so, which is pretty cool. And then Sue, oh, you heard about Sue. This is the first dinosaur skeleton that put a value on fossils. Um, before this happened, um, we, we could go in the field, we could go down to Kansas, we, we're in the field, we, we'd knock on a farmer's door and say, do you mind if we go have a look in the Badlands for some fossils? And they said, no, go ahead, just make sure you, you close the gates and no smoking so there's no fire. So we, we'd go out and do that. And then what happened was a private collector um, went on land and it was um, native land that was sort of part of the reservation, but not really part of the reservation. So they, they found this T-Rex, and the best T-Rex ever. They found it, they collected it, and then the person who said they owned the land turned out they didn't own the land, and it was owned by somebody else. And then the FBI came in and they confiscated the fossil. So the whole, the FBI raided the, the workshop in Black Hills, and they took the fossil away. And then the fossil was given back to the original landowner, and he said, well, he didn't really want it, but he'll sell it. <laughs> so what happened was it went up for auction, and uh, the uh, Disney, uh, Sony, the Field Museum, and maybe McDonald's all teamed up, and they um, bid it up, and they bid it up to $8.5 million. So all of a sudden, fossils had a price, and they had a price on their head. So the private collectors are very happy. So now everything they collect is worth a lot of money. But uh, the museums aren't too happy at all because now they have to pay, they have to get a lease for land. And you, you can do it. You can go in, into Montana or into Wyoming or um, Utah and you can find a landowner who will give you a lease and, and they spend anywhere from 10000 to $50,000 a year. But if they find anything, then the landowner gets a share in the value. So if they find a T-Rex, then they figure it's worth 8.5 million and, and they get a percentage of whatever that value is. Um, so from there, we, we had a foundry and we had molds of a T-Rex and this is MOR55. So they said, can we put a bronze dinosaur, or a bronze T-Rex in front of the Museum of the Rockies? So we put it all together and uh, it, it was from a, a donor who donated a couple million dollars to the Museum of the Rockies, and, and, and he also paid for the bronze sea rex to go out front. And then we had a little trip to China. Um, the uh, Three Gorges Dam in, uh, on, along the Yangtze River, and uh, this is it here. And all of this was up in here somewhere. Uh, Zigui, just, just the side of Zigui. And uh, what this says, it's an old um, poem, and it, it says, I don't know the exact interpretation, but what I've got is, is this area floods a lot, which I thought was <laughs> pretty funny. And, and, and supposedly it was carved back in the 1800s. So uh, it did, it did a lot of flooding. Um, while we're in China, we, we were approached by the Geological Museum in uh, Beijing, and they'd asked us if we'd 
build. And it, they had the design and they wanted us to build it. The, the, the first floor of their museum. It was a, we had a, an earth rotating. We had a, um, we had a little spaceship. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. We had a, a thing here. This was funny because at the time we were doing that, they, um, Google Earth hadn't come out yet. But you could buy uh, satellite footage from China, or from satellites that were flying over China. And the Chinese weren't very happy about it. So we went and we purchased a whole pile of footage. And I, I think the highest we got was about 250 meter flyover. And, and they could sit in the chair in this uh, here, the two chairs, and, and they had a screen that you could fly around China. So we designed and built this, and then we had a uh, topographic model of Beijing. And, and we went to the Geological Museum, I think it'd have some maps, topographic maps, and so we asked one, they said, no, no, you're not allowed that. You're not allowed to get a topographic map to build the model, because it's um, espionage. You, you, you're taking like, records of Chinese uh, topography that is, is illegal. So we ended up coming back, and then we went to Russia, and we, we found some people in Russia who had topographical maps of Beijing. And we, <laughs> so we just bought them through the Russians, and we built the models. Um, um, then we did a, a, the, the Beneski Museum in uh, Amherst. Massachusetts, and here it's pretty, we uh, designed and built all the frames here for their, the, the trackway collection. And uh, in these trackways, there's one really cool, and it's, uh, well, there's a couple. There's um, an impression in the stone, and it shows a, uh, a dinosaur hind feet, and it lay down, and you can see the pubis impression in the rock, and you can see where it lay down. Then there's another one, it's um, a fairly large rock, and there's small dinosaur tracks running through it. Then there's raindrops all the way that are preserved. And it's probably from, well, maybe 200 million years ago. And it's like, it shows that like one day, at one point in time, a little dinosaur was walking along a mud bank and it was raining. And that, that was just amazing. They have some really beautiful stones down there. And if you ever get a chance, it's at Amherst College in, uh, in Amherst, Massachusetts. You could look at it. Uh, we did the ROM, we did the, uh, the, the dinosaur halls, and we did the, uh, the mammal hall back in 2007. There's a, Gordo came in, and uh, I don't know if you have a story of Gordo, but um, I was flying out to uh, Wyoming with Dave Evans, who's the, the head curator at the ROM, and uh, he was looking for a Diplodocus skeleton for the new exhibits. So we were flying, and I had the, uh, the, the papers describing Diplodocus, and there was one that had a description of a Barosaurus, which is the skeleton over there, which is related to Diplodocus, it just has a much longer neck. So I, I gave the paper to him around the plane, and he's reading it, and he said, there's a ROM number, and there's another ROM number, and there are all these ROM numbers of all these fossils that were in Jack McIntosh's paper. So we land in Denver, and he called back to the museum, and he called his uh, assistant curator and said, could you have a look at this, uh, this number and what do we have in our collections? So it turned out that they had probably about 65% of the large sauropods in their collections. And here we were going out to look at one in the field to buy for their <laughs> exhibits. So you can just imagine like having a large sauropod, one of the largest animals ever known, hidden in a museum collection and not knowing where it was. So um, and then we found out that half the skeleton had been delivered. Uh, the, the curator back in the 60s had made a trade with the Carnegie Museum, and they got some specimens from the ROM. But the other side of it, all the other embarrassed specimens hadn't been delivered back to the ROM yet. So the Carnegie got their fossils, and uh, the Royal Terror Museum didn't get theirs. So we ended up preparing probably about, about a third of the animal. And, uh, and then we finished for, for their exhibit. Then we moved off to uh, Berlin, and th this job came up. Um, this was just after the wall came down, and uh, the, um, the, the director of the museum was a German fellow who was, uh, he, he, he'd been working in Kansas for a long time at the uh, University of Kansas, and then he was hired back by the museum 
um, to rebuild it. And uh, I went over there and uh, we had meetings with the staff and I've never seen somebody yell at a staff so much because the people like the wall had just come down and they didn't feel they had to change. They didn't feel that they're quite happy doing what they're doing and they didn't really have to do anything. And this museum, it was built um, probably in the early 1900s and it really hadn't got much further than what it was just before World War I. It, nothing had happened to it. Like it, it was the paint, the colors were the same. They had hallways that went nowhere. They had uh, galleries that were unopened. Uh, the back side of the building was all um, war damage. The machine gun had all fallen in. And uh, the, the director told them that they, they better welcome the modern age because it's coming and they're not going to stop it. And uh, he took a piece out of them and then they got on board and we worked them. They're great people to work with. You know, they, they enjoyed, we enjoyed them, they enjoyed us. But the job was to um, dismantle and remount the Diplodocus, the Brachiosaurus, uh, Decreosaur, Kentrosaur, Laphosaur, and a Dicelatosaurus. And this is us and our arrival. And the job that we had to do was to take it all down. So when they put it up, this is what they used. They had wooden scaffolding, and they put it all together and built it up. When we took it down, we used um, pipe and clamp scaffolding, and we had um, booms to, to lift us up to get it down. Uh, we're, we're, we're over in Berlin, all told, for about two years doing this. Um, here you can see the femur. I think this one's going up and ours is coming down. But uh, the one thing we found when we were taking this femur down was the, um, the steel had only gone in uh, to the bone maybe about a foot on the bottom and a foot at the top by the hip. And in the middle, there was a great big crack. So it was going up in one piece like that, but by the time we got to it, like this is probably um, eight, 80 years later, there, there was a crack in it and there was no metal holding that bone together and it could have quite easily just failed. But um, we, we got it down safely, so it was all right. Uh, this is our, our workshop in Berlin. This is the Dicreosaurus. And what we did, um, you, you can see now we run armature. This is the original fossil. And what we do, like we run the steel, and then we put armatures on all the bone, and, and it's all clamped together. We don't core bones anymore. Like that was probably, when I started my career back in the late 70s, early 80s, we did. We, used to, we had bone drilling machines that would just drill a hole right through a bone. But nowadays, we just do an external armature and we don't do any, any damage at all on the, the fossils. Um, and there it is at the opening. So the, the Brachiosaur, it's an interesting thing on the Brachiosaur, like it's an iconic dinosaur. Like it's a, this is what everybody knows. The, um, the very tall neck and the very um, tall, it's about 50 feet tall um, at the top of the head. But there's a lot of controversy from sauropod experts who don't think this guy can do that. And they, um, right here, at this point in the neck, there's a series of vertebra that would dictate if that neck could rear up or not. And Because here they have it walking with the neck raised. And it could probably raise its head up into here, naturally, but to walk with the head up like this is a, quite a feat. And then, supposedly they did find these bones in the field. There, the skeleton was, was found in Africa, Tendagaru, and, and the quarries show, and the, the field maps and the, the field notes and everything else show that these vertebrae were discovered, but we couldn't find them anywhere in the museum. We, we looked and we looked and we looked, and they said, no, no, we, they might have been here at some point, but they're not here anymore. But that would have changed the mount completely. But I think it was just one of these things, the Brachiosaur is so, so iconic, everyone knows the skeleton for what it is that they didn't want to change. They want to open new exhibits and change the animal completely. And we did some work in uh, Scotland. They opened the Naturist Museum in Scotland. In Brussels, we did work there. And then, so if I go back, so here, we're just done with Berlin. We're doing Edinburgh, the, British, or the Naturist Museum knows as Brussels knows. So this, this is about 2007. And we're thinking, should we move over to Europe? Should we put a, a branch of our site into Europe? 
And then the year after that, the big depression hit. So all those plans were put on hold. You know, so we, we never did carry on, but I think we could have, because, and mainly because the, um, the, the Berlin job went out for world tender. And um, they had, and it went all over the world, and we're the only company in the world that addressed the tender and put a bid in on it. No other company did. So there is an opportunity to expand, but we're getting, I'm getting old. <laughs> so we did the, uh, the Marine Hall, uh, the Ocean Hall at the Nat at Natural History of the Smithsonian. Um, then went to LA and did the um, L LA County uh, Mammal Hall. And the, um, the specimen here, uh, the, the ma mastodon, that, that was our first real venture into doing pr preparation on, on a cost base. Um, thing. So we bid the job and we said, okay, you know, they asked if we could prepare the fossil and we said, sure, because that's my background, the preparation. And we, we had done some preparation on the barosaur at the Rome. So here the, they sent us all the blocks and we prepared the skeleton out. So this is completely prepared and mounted in, in our shop. And that's when, when we started moving more into um, doing, working with more real fossil in the molds and the casts. And, uh, and here's the, the dinosaur hall. And he, here again, we, we mounted all of this. They don't have a lot of dinosaurs at the LA County. They, they have a field program now, so they are going out more. And then went to Patagonia. And this is a Foodalongosaurus. And uh, it's, it's in uh, Nail Cane, so it's in the north part of Patagonia. And these Quonsets here, um, the, the director, this is a museum. It's in, uh, in, in the Badlands. Um, and they've got more type specimens than a lot of museums in the world housed in the Quonset huts. But they have no money whatsoever. Like they are in the field, they're, they're going in the field quite often. And this, this is what the inside of the museum looks like. It's a dirt floor. And this is the food along source on display. And here you can see back here, this is all on display. So what we did, we went down and we took a scanner, 3D scanner, and we scanned the fossils. And then we developed everything on the, the five axis milling machine. And here, here it is going together here. We carved it out of foam and we, we, we took molds out of, um, we t took molds off, off a lot of the fossil, but we still have it all digitized. And this is a, on exhibit at the ROM, the Rontaire Museum. And here, we, we went, when we went down there, we, we had a scan, we shipped a scanner down and, and we had a handheld scanner. Uh, we never did see the, the scanner we shipped. It was, in, uh, it was in customs for eight months. And it, it never got away out of customs. It, it just went down, stayed in customs for eight months and came back to Canada. So, so luckily we, we had a, a handheld, a small, um, you can see it just here. This is the, the bone being scanned here. And uh, the technician here, he has a scanner and he's scanning it all. And th this was the first, first sauropod dinosaur ev ev ever developed completely digital. Uh-oh. Can you advance the slide? Something's there. Okay, I'm under control. So now, now we do all the, uh, the, the preparation restoration in-house. Um, the blacksmithing, this is what the armatures look like. Um, you, can, you can see uh, holding the bone here, a little armature. So on staff now, we have five blacksmiths, and this is what they do. They hammer out the armatures, and uh, very, very delicate work. Well bending steel and then putting it on a very fragile fossil. It, it's quite a skill. Um, and then we have conservators who fix the things the blacksmiths break. <laughs> and here, um, for the, the Berlin job, what we did, we, we had uh, six skeletons to do, to, to build. But uh, at the time we had three blacksmiths and they couldn't go over for a year, you, you know, leave their families. And we were in Beansville at the time. So what we did, we scanned everything. We scanned uh, three skeletons, and then we, we printed all the elements. And then our blacksmiths, they built the armatures on uh, prints. 
So they, they made the armatures for three skeletons in our shop in Beansville, and then we shipped all the armatures over, and then we fit the armatures to the uh, original fossil material. So the, the blacksmiths were only away from home for two months in, instead of uh, for a year or more. Uh, here we're putting the, uh, the foundry to use. This was a um, bronze T-Rex, the same one we cast before. And this was a donor from the Museum of the Rockies again. And where this is, this is beside this trout st stream. He's got like a few thousand hectares of land. And you drive horseback, you go on horseback, you come over a hill, look down the trout stream, and there's a T-Rex, bronze T-Rex lying beside the stream. Now the whales, um, 2014, uh, a pod of whales um, drowned in the, the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And uh, in the spring of 2014, they all, they tried to sink, there are nine whales in the pod. They, tried, they sank uh, six of them, three that they didn't manage to sink. The, the, the Coast Guard was trying to sink them before they came to shore. So the one, uh, the first one we got was a uh, Trout River, I believe. And it washed into shore right beside their brand new boardwalk. And this is in May. Um, the two, four weekends just coming on. Summer's going to start. And they've got this great big stinky whale lying beside their boardwalk. So the, they called. The, the Royal Ontario Museum, uh, um, they have a mandate to collect one of every whale from the Atlantic and the Pacific. And the, the eventually, one day, they're going to build a whale, build a whale exhibit at the ROM, so they call us to collect them. So we have a crew, we collect about seven or eight whale skeletons now. So we bundle up our knives and away we go. And here they said, well, can you not do it in front of our boardwalk? <laughs> so so we, uh, we, we flensed part of it, we got some weight off it, and then we, um, we hooked it up to a trawler, we found a trawler, and they grabbed on the, the tail, and they sailed it around to um, Woody Point, where it was a, um, a boat repair yard and because the fishing industry is not very busy right now we could pull the whale right up and then we could use backhoes and heavy equipment to to flens it to take off all the flesh so we collected the one at trout river and then another one came in at rocky harbor so the um the royal Ontario museum had dibs on the first one so the next one went to uh memorial university or it will be going it's in our shop right now and i think this fall Fall of 2020, we'll put it on exhibit. So what we did, we um, we got all the bones, we brought them back, and we got a container, and uh, we cut holes in the roof to let air in, and then this is all compost, and these are all the bones, the whale bones. What we did, we, we put down a layer of bone, a layer of compost, a layer of bone, a layer of compost, so we filled it all up as best we could, and it sat in there for um, about a year, year and a bit, decomposing getting rid of all the flesh and the bugs and the, well, yeah, pretty well. Yeah, the, there's a lot of bugs, a lot of flies, a lot of stuff going on when you bring a whale in. So it got, um, this was it cleaned um, after it came out of the compost. Then what we did, we got two swimming pools and we set them up because it was the only thing that, that could house the, the, a blue whale skull because they're huge. The, the jaw of a blue whale is probably the biggest bone ever from any animal that's ever lived on Earth. So that's what we're dealing with. And here, you can see what we did. We put a tent over top. Then we got um, some hot water pumps with detergent. And then we, we put a, a spray all the way around the pool. And we had a tent on top. And we ran hot water through it all. Because what we had to do, we had to get all the oil out of the bone. Because there's a mass amount of oil in bones, which is why they used to collect whales. The, the whaling industry was all for the oil. And uh, what we had to do was take the oil out. So that they were in the, um, in the tent for probably about another eight months before we got rid of all the oil. And then they're all set to mount. And there's the, um, the mount at the ROM that was uh, in 2017. <clears throat> and this, is one, this one's in our shop now. And uh, it'll be all set to go this fall. It, it, it's finished. It just takes up a lot of room. And uh, then we were at the Smithsonian. We did, uh, we did their new halls, which just opened um, in June of this year. Uh, we went into the Smithsonian. We dismantled uh, 48 skeletons. And we brought them all back to Trenton. And then uh, so, so we tagged everything. We, 
we, the crates are all made in, uh, in the county. And then we, we cut all the foam, we cut and we velcro all the bones in place and put them in the crates. Uh, everything gets tagged. There's a, every bone gets tagged on the animal. And, and it worked really well. We shipped all the skeletons and I think we had maybe three bones broke in, in the process. Uh, went back to Argentina shortly after that and we found the biggest, or we helped develop the biggest sauropod ever, Patagotitan. And, uh, and here the, they were collected in the field and while they were collecting it, they brought it back to the lab, they prepare half. We went down, we scanned half the skeleton and they flipped all the blocks, prepared the other side, called us back in and we scanned the other side. So we, we developed another um, skeleton digitally. Um, this is it here. This is in, uh, the reason the lighting's so weird is because they had no electricity and they had a bunch of trucks parked <laughs> and shining the lights on it until they can get the electricity going. And we had to have this mounted at uh, BBC were coming in in um, the morning and we were there and I think we got away about four o'clock in the morning. And for most of that time we had no power. We just had truck headlights and, uh, and putting it all together with, with, with generators. And, uh, but then uh, we did that for the American Museum of Natural History and there it is on display and the dinosaur is so big it won't fit in the hall so the head sticks out of the hall <laughs> and when, when people come up the stairs they can see the head um, sticking out <laughs> greeting them <clears throat> uh, the blue whale in England this is Hope remember I mentioned the Diplodocus early on that was in the main foyer at the Natural History Museum well, they called and asked if we'd do a, uh, a blue whale. Uh, so we, we rented a shop just outside of Oxford. At a, a, it was an old hangar, an airline hangar. And, uh, and that's it there now. It's a beautiful specimen. And the Smithsonian opened in June of 2019. Um, that was exciting. It was, Quite a project, biggest project we've had, and probably one of the biggest projects that ever in, in paleontology that, that happened in the U.S. And it was good to be part of it. Uh, last summer, <clears throat> we went to Wyoming, finally got back in the field. I said I used to love going in the field. This is probably the first time going back. It's in August of 2019, and we'll be going back there this coming summer. And it's a project called the Jurassic Mile. And it's uh, the Children's Museum of Indiana, in Indianapolis. Um, the Natural History Museum was part of it and the a museum out of uh, Holland, uh, part of it. And what we have here is, uh, th this is our crew, the RCI crew with the, the, the paleontologist, Phil Manning. And this is the, the scapula, the, the, the shoulder blade of um, a, a diplodocus, or an apatosaur, sorry. And this is it in the field, and this, these are the badlands. And then last summer, we went northern Ontario. Uh, dinosaurs have never been found in Ontario. Um, we don't really have the rocks for it. Where the Ice Age comes in and just sort of pushes everything away, and we don't really have any deposits, except there's a little pocket just on the, the west side of James Bay and uh, the Missinabbe River. So we went up there to have a look, and you can only get in by helicopter. Well, we could probably try to get in by boat, but it's a tough go. Uh, ATVs we can't get in with, so the helicopter was the easiest way. And this is an exploration trip with the ROM and uh, for our up-and-coming museum, which I'll talk about later. And uh, what we found, there's all these rocks, and right here, that little black thing, that's a tree. And then here, we have a tree. So um, what it is, it's a spillway for the, a dam, or th three dams. And uh, it runs, it's the overflow, so in the spring it runs really hard. When the, the water, when the thaw and everything, it runs down this little creek, Adam Creek it's called. And what it's done, it's caused, it's opened up this gorge like this. And there's probably 32 kilometers of uh, lower Cretaceous deposits lying there. And no one's really went up to have, a, no one's gone up to have a look at it. I went years ago, when I first got to the ROM, we went and had a look and we didn't, we found a lot of plant material. But now, <clears throat> what it looks like is the, um, the bed of the, um, the creek. There's all these rocks, which are field stones, more or less. We've got a Pleistocene deposit on top of the Cretaceous. So when the water comes roaring down, all the rocks come tumbling down. They go tumbling down the creek bed, 
If there is any bone there, it's just going to crush it. So what we have to do, every year it's going to change, but the, the logs, and you can see it here, and you, this is a whole log with roots. These are the roots coming down. This is a tree trunk. So chances are we will find a dinosaur there. So we're going back uh, probably the, this, this coming September, and we'll, we'll send a crew in, and we'll spend some time there and see if we can find something. Um, our crew just left yesterday uh, for the Yale Peabody Museum. And the exciting part here is this is the original brontosaurus. You know, no brontosaurus, so this is the original one. You know, the Copa Marsh Wars and all this sort of stuff, like this is um, Marsh's territory. So uh, this is the original process. We'll be dismantling this over the next two months. This and uh, assorted other um, dinosaur skeletons and bring them back to our shop. And that's our ne next big project. Between this and the uh, um, Indianapolis project, where we're going in the field, we're collecting the dinosaurs and, and mounting two sauropods for them and this job here. And they're both going to go on for the next two years. And now, I'm sure you've heard about what we're planning for our area. So um, I can't talk a lot about it, but we are going to build exhibits um, in, in Quinty West. And what, what I'm hoping is, is going to be um, a trip through time punctuated by extinction events. So it, it'll go all the way back to the invertebrates and the, all the rocks we have here in Ontario. And then hopefully we'll find some dinosaurs up there. We can have the first dinosaur fossil on exhibit at the Quinney West Town Hall. That's what I'm hoping. I have a piece of tree, but it's not so exciting. People can go and look at the tree. You know, like they have a dinosaur bone. And all we need is one little bone. Like you need a tooth or a vertebra or a bit of a leg or something like that. And like we're on our way. So um, this is probably four years away. We're interviewing right now for an executive director. Uh, the, the town of Quinney West is su supporting us for the next four years um, in, a, in a small way, enough to hire an, an, an executive director and, and to get the fundraising going. So we're going to spend the, the next four years fundraising and hopefully we'll start building within two, two and a half years. And uh, the projections are like we'll probably have about 15,000 square feet of exhibit space. Um, we're working with the ROM. We can probably put a postdoc position um, from the ROM. We, we can post them in, in Trenton. So we'll have a curator on staff. And uh, we'll have original fossil from the ROM on exhibit, plus whatever we collect. So hopefully, hopefully we get some stuff out of Wyoming, too. We can bring that in in Northern Ontario. And uh, we'll have, have a great natural history museum here in our area. And there it is. And that's it. <laughs> so, thank you. So if there's any, any questions. So I'm good for questions. If anybody has any questions, we've got a bit of time, I think. Yes? Um, crossing the border with all those bolts, what's the... It's fairly easy. Believe it or not. Well, we've been doing it for so long, and uh, we have all the codes in place. And uh, usually the trucks now don't even get opened up. We just have, just the way shipping is today, you, you pre clear everything. So everything's got a tag and a code, and everything goes through uh, the broker, and they get everything clear. And we've got the right codes for bones. And it, it's the hardest part we have is getting our staff into the States. You know, the last little while, it's been getting tougher and tougher to get in there. But the crew left yesterday and everyone arrived safely. And the, the, truck got, the, the truck with the tools got hung up for about 45 minutes. But the, but the guys didn't, so it was just the truck. Yeah? So you mentioned that the older um, fossils were sometimes uh, preserved by putting metal through bone itself, which damages mm -hmm. the bone. Yep. Now you don't do that, you use external metal. Yeah. But if you're restoring an old skeleton, would you take advantage of the fact that the metal is inside? Or um, we probably couldn't get the metal out. A lot of time, what we do, we'll cut it off, and then we'll, if we can get the metal out, we will. And then we backfill it with plaster, plaster of Paris, then we clean it all off. Some of the, um, the, the Pleistocene things that are um, 
not really heavily fossilized. We, we can get things that, because they still have a spongy marrow and, and we can work the metal out of it and then we can backfill it with the plaster. But the, the, the dinosaurs are tough because they're, uh, we, we just cut off the metal and leave it in there. Oh, how much time? How much time did it take for dinosaurs to become extinct? Um, well, the asteroid hit, right? So when the asteroid hit, things happened pretty quickly. Um, well, the Earth was blacked out, they figure about 50,000 years. Yeah, just like all the soot that was in the air. And uh, so over that length of time, like the, the plants and the animals. So I, I really don't know, but I, I'd say it was probably within hundreds of years. Hundreds of years? Yeah. They, they were, like they say, the, the amount of species they're finding just under the, the boundary, the KT boundary, the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, they're, they're getting less and less and less. So they feel the dinosaurs were uh, dwindling, but they don't know if they're finding the depo the, enough deposits at that point in time to find out how many animals were living. But there was one neat story, I know you read it in the New York Times, or the New York, somewhere around New York anyway. They, um, a fell in, a, a paleontologist, and he's in, um, working in South Dakota. And what they found, he's found some fish. And in the fish, they're finding um, little bits of glass, sphericals, they feel are coming from when the asteroid hit. So when the asteroid hit, things blew up and then spheric glass spherical flew through the air. And it would have been, um, I think they're saying something like four hours to get from Mexico, the Yucatan, where it hit, flying through the air, got to North Dakota. But then the, these spherical's land in the water, got in the gills of the fish, and then a tsunami, or a small tsunami, a big wave push came up, and it took about, I don't know, like maybe 12 hours for the cement to come and flooded everything as far north as uh, South Dakota and jumbled everything up. And they're finding these fish and other animals all jumbled together. And they feel that they've got a pretty good snapshot of that point in time. Now, it's under debate. Like, it's a neat story. Like, it's a great story. But there, a lot of paleontologists are still waiting for more information to come out from this locality. So, yes, we'll go there. Depends where you are. Yeah. In Canada, you can't. Like, uh, all th throughout Canada, they the have pretty strict rules on uh, taking fossils personally. And especially Alberta, if you go in the Badlands, they, uh, and you park your car by the side of the road, if it's by the side of the road for more than a day, you'll have people coming asking what you're up to. Um, in the States, um, if you're a private landowner, you own the fossils. So you could, if you had the landowner's permission, if you go to the uh, Bureau of Land Management down there, they'd say, no, you can't go there without a permit. Yes? Um, it's not very technical, but how do you know a region? What made you decide to locate in Quinty West? And, and do you think you faced additional challenges trying to create your museum? Um, no, I, I don't think so. Why did we, we come to Quinty West? We were in uh, Beansville. So when I started, we were in Toronto because I was working at the ROM. Then we moved to Oakville, and then we moved around the corner to Beansville, and then we had to expand. We got to the point. We had about 25,000 square feet in Beansville. We had to expand, and um, we just uh, we threw a net out in southern Ontario, really. And uh, my production manager's from Port Hope, and uh, my wife's family's Gananoque, um Perth area, so we thought if we move this way, it'd be more fun. And we came in, in the building. The, the building's just perfect for building dinosaurs. It's, a, it's got good high ceilings, um, 50,000 square feet. We can, like where we were before, there's no way we'd get a blue whale and a sauropod skeleton in the same place. And here we could probably get two blue whales and three or four sauropods. You know, so it, it, you know, it's helped w w with the growth of the company. 
and plus the, the, um, the life out here. You, you know, like I, I, I had uh, 25 employees when we decided to move, and I polled staff to see who would move w with us if we did move. And if, they, if the staff would have said no, we wouldn't have moved. But out of the 25 employees, 20 said sure, they'd love to move. And I think a lot of it is, um, you know, out here we don't have the influence of the GTA. You know, it's not, I know it's changing, like the last few years, but when we came out, we've been here, what, 13 years now, and there's no influence from the GTA, so housing was affordable compared to the city, and even Beans was under the influence of the GTA. So all the staff came out, everyone's bought a home, and we've got families now and everything else, so, you know, and the quality of life out here is just fantastic, and everyone's really happy. Okay. Yep. Um, depends if it's a real fossil or it's a cast. Um, if we're doing a cast, uh, T Rex takes about 580 hours. Um, if we're doing a real fossil, if we do real a real fossil T Rex, uh, probably. Well, the blue whale. We just went through a blue whale. To mount a blue whale skeleton is. 3,000 hours. So we, we track the time on all the jobs, which is how, how we quote the jobs. We just have, like we probably mounted uh, probably 900 to 1,000 skeletons over the 30 years, and we've tracked the time on everything. So now we can go back. If someone wants a, a brontosaurus mounted, we can go back to a diplodocus, which is pretty close to a brontosaurus, and check the hours, and then we, we put the two together. Yeah. What kind and how many skills do your employees have, and where do you find these employees? Okay, that's good. We've got, uh, we'll start at the back of the shop. We have molding and casting, and we have conservators, we have preparators, we have the blacksmiths, we have metal workers, um, we have finishing people, the, the sculptors, the painters, we have the, the artists who do the finishing work. Um, we've got the foundry people who work in the foundry, who are usually very close to the metal workers and the blacksmiths. They sort of all relate to that. So I have um, 35 employees and a, quite a range of uh, skill between them. And what we try to do, um, if it gets a little bit quieter, we'll take a blacksmith and we'll put him in molding and casting. So he learns those skills too. And then we'll take someone in molding casting, put them in the foundry. And we just sort of have a very good pool of employees who are pretty adaptable and can work anywhere in the shop. And that's just uh, something I've learned over the years. When we used to work at the museums, we always pooled our employees. So that, you know, like if, say it's quiet in the foundry, no one's in the foundry, we could take the people working in the foundry and put them into molding casting. And the preparation conservation is a little bit trickier because you have to have very soft hands. You have to have... Um, quite a bit of skill when you're preparing a fossil, you know, especially when it's coming out and it's one of a kind and you know, it's the only one ever discovered, then a little bit of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Actually, I mean, what about the dinosaurs, like the bones? I mean, okay. But the vegetarian, basically, dinosaurs, do you know much about their, veg their vegetation? Um, um, like yep. In terms of fossilized? Um, yep, there's lots of, lots of plants and trees, and depending where you are, um, you've got sequoias, you've got ginkgo, ginkgo trees, magnolias. There was no grass. Grass didn't come until after, after the Cretaceous. So there was no uh, grass ferns, things like that. And, they, and depending on the teeth, uh, some have grinding teeth, some have they strip teeth. And uh, okay, you behind. You got one right behind you who keeps trying. Yeah. Um, I probably wouldn't say that, but I might have some of my technicians might, because <laughs> I feel like I always think it's good to challenge them. Um, usually, I don't think we've ever turned in. Uh, there's been a couple small jobs that I felt we could have done, and the staff didn't think they wanted to, but then it turned out they went to somebody else to do it. And I always tell my staff, I say, look, that's what happens, you know, because if they come to us and if we can't do it, they will find somebody who will do it. 
you know, because like that's what we are. We're craftsmen. Like, you know, like if and if there's a challenge there with materials or, you know, like um, if they don't want mounts to be seen, if they don't want, you know, like if they want things to be clean or, or no armature, you know, like then, then we can accommodate them most of the time. And, and it's a challenge, you know, but that's what, what makes the job so good. And, you know, walking into, you know, Yale, uh, the, the Yale Peabody, and, you know, we have to dismantle uh, the brontosaurus, the original brontosaurus, and they've also got a turtle there. And we looked, it's a great big turtle, Archelon. It's probably got a six foot shell. But the, um, the glue joints are all starting to crystallize. So I know when we take that down, it's going to break. And we, we just know it's going to break. So what we have to do is control the break, you know, because it's been sitting there since the early 1900s, and it's never been cleaned or conserved or anything else. So this is the first time we're going to get a hold of it. So what we're going to do, we're going to scan it. <clears throat> we're going to scan the shell, and then we're going to carve a big foam support for it. And then we'll, we'll take it down, and then we'll attach the foam, and then we'll just lower the whole thing together. And if there is any break, it, it, any breakage, it'll all stay in place. Like, we won't lose anything. And then our guys just go in and fix it. Yes? Um, <clears throat> not every museum can go in the field and collect original bone. You know, like, like it is expensive. Um, you know, by the time you put a crew together, um, like a crew of, from our point of view as a business, to send a crew of six in the field for a month is probably about a quarter million dollars. Now, a museum probably doesn't approach it the same way we do because they have staff and they have their budget and they have, um, they can take their staff out of the lab and put them in the field and they're still paying their staff if they're there or they're there. You know what I mean? And they don't, they don't have to make money. The museum has a budget. So um, where when we go in the field, be, being a private enterprise, We'll give them a, a cost, you know, because I do have to pay my employees, you know, and like we do have to pay overhead for the building and all that sort of stuff comes into it. So if a museum can go in the field and collect, they will. And if they can't, then the option they have is to buy a cast and then put a cast on the exhibit. And, uh, and there's only so many really, really good dinosaurs in the world. And we have molds of a few of them, like quite, I wouldn't say of everything, but we have some molds of some iconic specimens. So if a museum in Japan wants a big sauropod, then we can supply that. And, and if they want a T-Rex, then we can supply that. Yes? No, we have licensing agreements with the institutions we work with. So what, I, what we do, we have a licensing agreement on sales. We send a percentage back to the museum. So it helps fund their, their paleontology department. Yes? If you were to retire, <laughs> <laughs> would your business continue? Yep. Yeah. yeah. I have no worries about that. <clears throat> yeah, it's all set up. So... Uh, the staff I've got right now are doing things so much better than I ever did. I was kicked out of the back oh, probably 15 years ago. <laughs> they just told me to get, go work in the office. Go, go be a salesman and drum up and administer the company. Let us do the work. And, and, and they brought things in, you know, like they, we've got a machine shop. We've got, you know, the scanners. We've got uh, printers and, and all of that. You know, like um, the, the hardest part probably is if, knowing when to take a risk, you know, like knowing when to walk into a job and um, knowing how good your staff are and how far you can push them and what they can do. And, and I think that's running a business. That's the hardest thing, you know, to, to get them to believe in themselves and, and don't be afraid of taking some chances. Because, you know, we, we did an um, exhibit in Shanghai, China. And uh, it, it was the funniest thing. Like, we were sitting... Um, the front door, I think we were getting ready to leave. And uh, Mercedes pulled up with two people from China in it. 
and well, they, were, they were Chinese, but they're from North, North Toronto. And, and they're sitting in the talking. We're looking at them. I wonder what they're doing. They came in. They said, would you be able to build an exhibit in China? And I said, well, what kind of exhibit? And it was a natural history exhibit. It wasn't dinosaurs. It was sort of uh, coral reefs. And um, it was all natural history based, like uh, sculpture of coyotes, sculpture of herons, uh, deep sea vents and things like that. And, and it was like we didn't know them. We didn't know who they were. But they seemed they had a pretty good story. And then we asked them to come back, and they came back with the architect who was building the exhibits in Shanghai. And I, I thought it was a good thing to go. Like my project managers didn't like it at all. But then they weren't aware of the financial part of the business either. Where I knew if that, that job coming in, it would really help us at that point in time. And it was a good time to do it. You know, and otherwise, like, you know, like it was a pretty good job. Like, you know, like it was like eight months worth of work for probably 20 people. So that's the hardest part is to getting them to take risks and be comfortable doing it. Okay. That's good. Well, uh, thank you, Peter. Okay. I didn't know uh, so much about the... Uh uh, it's really amazing. Yeah. There are so many little parts to uh, learn to really yeah. They're not all in Ottawa, the dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>